that's so exciting. The countdown makes it. I, I want to just do a countdown. Can we just have a podcast countdown? Dave. <laughs> You're live, Dave. Look happy. I, 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 was, I was fixated on the live counter, which I thought was counting down, and then I realised it was counting up. So we had actually. Yeah, started. yeah, we've started. That that was your. That was your. This is Dave's waiting face. Well, now you know. There you go. If you have, I mean, that's going to mean that if you're ever in the doctor's office, people are going to recognise you immediately because they'll be mm. like, "I know that face." I'm waiting <laughs> for a podcast. So, uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to a sort of live edition. No, it's not a sort of. It is a live <laughs> edition of um, Terrible Lizards, which is our podcast about dinosaurs, with me, Izzy Lawrence, and him, Dr. Dave Hone. Um. Yeah, you can speak. <laughs> <laughs> See, I am the professional broadcaster and comedian, I, and I Dave... I think there was a lot for me to say. I mean, you'd said me that. Was... Well... Unless somebody asks him a question, Dave doesn't talk. So it's very important. If you are watching right now, please do say hello. We can see your comments come up. Already we've had, we've got AF Harold saying hello. We've yeah. got Ross saying hello, hello. We have Janet Real saying hello. Yeah. And we have Mark Vincent saying, why hello. Why hello. So why hello? exactly. Why hello? Is that beautiful? Yeah. Lucy is here. Now that's yeah. Lucy Ecclesley, who was on a previous episode of Terrible Lizards. She famously um, had a look at an archaeopteryx and did that for her dissertation, I believe. Mm. And then also yes. for sexual selection and... Yes, and we got very into fish at that point, which aren't dinosaurs. And our next episode that anyway. we've got coming up is not about dinosaurs either. However, we're going to talk about dinosaurs now because there's this thing that's been in the news, Dave, that I want to know about, and it's this. Oh, it's a not massive even... new... Yeah, a massive new dinosaur might be the largest creature to ever roam Earth. Look at it. Yes. Somebody maybe. like CGI. What do you mean, maybe? What's, uh, what's the scepticism all about? Well, so, I mean, since we very first started and made a list of things we do episodes on, one of the things I want to do an episode on is the largest dinosaurs and how we measure the size of dinosaurs and, and how we know. Um, and indeed, we've, we've definitely mentioned this at least a couple of times before we talk about footprints. Every few years, there is a new paper or study suggesting that species X or discovery X is now the largest dinosaur ever. And there's no particular reason to think that this one is any different from the last dozen times this has happened in the last dozen years. And it's a credible candidate for the largest dinosaur ever, but it's not actually necessarily the largest dinosaur ever. And even if it was, it would merely be the largest dinosaur we've discovered rather than necessarily the biggest one. So, so it's can, sorry, kind of cool, can, but not really. <laughs> it's like, I've heard this so many times and I know I'll hear it again. You're just jaded. I think it's really exciting. They've discovered a massive dinosaur. Surely that's got to be worthwhile. Because look, look, look how big it is. Hang on. I don't know if you've seen how big it is. Oh, yeah. Look, I mean, those those are... are normal sized people. Well, yeah. compared to, you know, probably not compared to us, but, you know, they're. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, and that's a bit of the... By the looks of things upside down. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> pardon my French, sodding massive, but is it <laughs> any more massive than any of the other giant ones that we've, that we've had? Um, so I think there was an image of Patago Titan. It just saw the name go past. So that's the really big one that was on display in the American Museum of Natural History for a couple of years and is now in Chicago. Um, and that's been described as the largest ever, but so has Dreadnoughtus and Argentinosaurus and at least a couple of others. Um, Dreadnoughtus is an amazing name for yeah, a dinosaur. Plus, plus various fragmentary bits. Um, and this is really the issue that e even if we had perfect, complete whole skeletons, um, that still wouldn't really tell you, of all those different species, that still wouldn't really tell you which was the biggest, quote unquote, um, because things vary an awful lot. I mean, you know, just the muscle and fat. So a, a stat I love rolling out that I found. So basically, OK, this is a bit of an extreme form because not many animals do this. But bears, when they go into the start of their hibernation, weigh about double what they do when they come out of hibernation. Wow. Right. That's, that's some hard yeah. going. Right. That's a and, lot of blueberries, that is. Right, so they're, they're particularly salmon. skinny when they come out, obviously, and they're particularly fat when they go in. 
but it means that if you got a skeleton of a big bear and estimated its mass to be anything from 150 to 300 kilos, both those numbers could be 100% right, and you've got 100% error. So when we've got bits of some skeletons, <laughs> it's really hard to go, oh, yeah, that one was bigger than this one, because we don't know. No, okay, but still, I mean, because the, the thing is, like, you guys already, like, you guys, you paleontologist people, right? I know what you do, because you, you, we've talked about how you can extrapolate the size of animals from oh, the yeah. footprints, from a thing. But when you actually find one that's this big, it kind of, doesn't it sort of go, oh, look, the potential, we're right in this potential? Um, yeah, yeah, sort of, because... <laughs> Because we've already got animals like this, you know, if, if we wound the, the discovery clock back 70, 80 years and the biggest thing that we've got that's credible at that point is Brachiosaurus or in North America or Giraffe Titan in uh, Africa and a few other mystery bits which are now mostly lost or undescribed or haven't been studied properly. And this thing was found. It would be off the chart massive but there's half a dozen animals every bit as big as this one already and therefore if it is bigger than the others it's moving the notch you know incrementally up a couple of percentage points maybe um, i've just i've just noticed you know your um talk about like you know your a bear going into hibernation being much less than not well behind me is a vast beast who in the summer shrinks down to the size of a normal cat but in winter is massive and there she is that is susan behind me having a wash just thought i would clear that up for anybody watching um okay then so that's not ice i tell you what else has been in the news though you know, other than your, we found the largest dinosaur ever, so what, right? Other than that, <laughs> well, well, okay. It, so just, just before we move on, I mean, it is still a very cool find. There seems to be a lot more of it than many of these really big dinosaurs. Um, and from the photos that I've seen that you've just shown and others I've seen online, they look to be extremely well preserved, which is really nice. But to my knowledge, there's no actual scientific paper out yet. This is a kind of pre-press release about the work that they're doing. And I will be amazed after all of this when there's an actual scientific publication that they can really make a convincing case that that specimen is definitely bigger than all the others because I really don't think it's going to happen. So, yeah, Joshua's comment going up there, it, that is exactly it. There's half a dozen giant titanosaurs, which is this group of sauropods, most of which are in South America, most of which were in that list that I mentioned earlier, and some other really giant big ones knocking around in other places. But yeah, there's. I, it's probably very unhelpful to talk about the biggest. And as I say, even if you found it, you know, you could sample, you know, ten thousand humans tomorrow, you know, and that's a lot of people. And nice. the odds of you getting someone who's over about six foot eight, six foot nine is really, you know, two meters ish is really small, and yet. The biggest people, and even then excluding, so famously Robert Waldo, the really giant person who had great major growth hormone issues, but even just people who are just really big, you know, top well out above that number. And you're just not going to find them in that kind of sample. So when we've got half a skeleton of a species, the idea that you could prove that that individual, that species is the largest ever <laughs> is basically meaningless. And also, you know, the largest ever dinosaur could have died before it reached its full potential. This yeah, is the thing. that's another do, classic. Do we know if sauropods ever stopped growing? Hmm, um, pr probably not entirely. Um, so we know that the, the growth trajectory in general of dinosaurs, and as usual, this is smearing over a huge amount of variation, is it starts a bit slow, goes up very rapidly, and then tails off but that tail carries on for a very long time. Um, and there is an issue as to whether they are, they have determinate growth, which is what we have, you know, we, we often drag on a little into our late teens and even early twenties. But then once we stopped that, that really is it. And that someone and we start who, to shrink. Someone, yeah. Someone who's 22 is going to be exactly the same height as they will be at 
50, barring a little bit of cartilage compression. Um, but if they so, were a crocodile, they'd carry right, well, on. Right, very slowly. Yeah, a crocodile, once it hits its the, the top of that curve, what we call the asymptote, once it hits that, its growth is very slow, but it is still growing. Um, and I we think, learned a new word today, and that's asymptote. Okay. Um, so I think most, I think most paleontologists would say, because I don't look at growth that much, that many dinosaurs probably had this, which is indeterminate growth. That is, as long as they're alive, they'll still grow. But it might be very, very slow indeed, to the point of being almost negligible uh, in these kinds of animals. But again, we don't have a very good sample size for sauropods. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put up a, a thing by Alan. Um, he says, "Rar, rar, Alan." Um, does anyone remember what Dave mentioned about the things that we can do to help paleontologists think? He mentioned image manipulation being one of them. Are there any others? Many thanks. So I presume um, it's things like footprints and also. Do you know what um, he's talking about there? Uh, I think the last episode of series one, we talked about ways non-academics can get involved in science. And I think, I think that was series two. Was it series two? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. It well, might be the latest series. Well, no, it can't. Well, again, for, for us, we record them so long before they go out and then they get edited. <laughs> we don't always remember what's in them. Um, I think he's talking about that. And I talked about stuff like, paleontologists who are preparing images for papers and doing things like digital cutout of photographs is enormously time consuming and we're not very good at it. And so if other people want to contribute and help with that, people who are good at that kind of thing will undoubtedly do a better job and save us time, which means that we can spend more time doing the researchy bit rather than the fiddly computer cutout bit. I think that's what Alan's getting at. Um, I'm not sure if it is what Alan's getting at, but it's episode. It was we said it. It sounds like you know if you. It sounds like you're making it even more, um, you know, like Blue Peter than it actually is your job. So uh, there we go. So um, um, Joshua also wants to add on um, Barosaurus, uh, which is probably longer. So we're talking about weight here, aren't we? Yeah, we're we're we're, talking about height. Weight. I mean, the supposedly there's a there's a the bootlace worm, which is longer than a blue whale, but its diameter is about this. No one would call that bigger than a blue whale. Um, yeah, what we're interested in is weight or mass, because that is what influences your physiology and your food and water requirements and your locomotion and all this other stuff. Yeah, there are dinosaurs with enormously long necks and particularly enormously long tails, where you can make them very, very long without necessarily making them much heavier i mean there are some lizards too if you if people look up um oh i, I can, I, can do this lizards, but I don't mean whiptail lizards i mean something else ah now i can't remember the. it's all right you carry race on talking runners. i'll find it uh look up race, race runners um some race of them, runners race runners as okay. in people that would run a race race runner lizards some of them have tails that are like 10 12 times the length of the actual little lizard with his head and his feet sticking out um, so you, you know, that thing's the size of a Komodo dragon in terms of length, but it's still a lizard about this big. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just having a look. I can't find one with a long tail. It's really not because I've seen them way longer than they've got them all. I'll, I'll do that one. Hang yeah, on, hang on. So very long tail lizard, I'm sure, would probably work on Google. Yeah, let's have a look. Du, du, du. There you go. He's not yeah. very long. They're ridiculously no. long also. This is longer than his body, which yeah. no, is I'm... unnecessary. Yes, I, I'll have a... So is that... Is that No, you can't. Dave, Dave, you can't. Just... Oh. You see, what? the thing is, I'm sharing my screen. He's not sharing his screen. And therefore, right. he's got to send it to me in the private chat. Meanwhile, we're meant to be entertaining you people. Yeah, and know. watching a man Google is not entertaining. Or, no, or no. is it? <laughs> we can we can focus in depends, on depends Dave's on face. This is Dave's googling face. Everybody, look at him. Is look it, at him is race. It, is it any uh, better? Than... <laughs> there we go. Um, if yeah. you pop that in our private chat, Dave, I will I will flash it up to everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm trying desperately, but, but yeah, any any I, any anyone can quickly Google long tail race runner. Lizard, uh, I think soon do. So is is the reason more. that you get. Um, lizards with such weirdly long tails is that just sexual selection or is there other uh, motivations for it i don't actually know i've 
I think I mentioned last year, I've got a paper on dinosaur tales coming out very soon. Um, of course and, you do. Of course you do. Of that, I've been looking at tales in other things. Um, and I got I got into really long tailed lizards when I lived in Germany, and there was a really nice exotic pet shop down the road from me, and they had a a, a vivarium with these in, and I simply hadn't seen these lizards before then, and went, oh my god, I didn't know lizards had tails like that. That's really interesting. I found basically nothing in the scientific literature about why they have these absurdly long tails in some of these individuals or some of these species. So I, as usual, I don't actually know. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, we have a concerned Richard Ball saying is safe search on. Uh, hopefully, I, yeah. I don't know. So let, let's yeah. let's 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 not worry about that. Uh, hopefully, there isn't anything too explicit from uh, long-tailed lizard. Uh, uh, William Donahue says, uh, Zooniverse probably has a citizen science program looking at paleontology data. Very good. And Joshua is also suggesting quite wisely split screen sharing. And that would have been, well, things, we're learning how to do this, guys. We're learning. <laughs> we need your love and your suggestions for when we are doing all of this. Now, another thing came into um, my attention, actually in a physical, you know, these things called newspapers, you can hold them. This was in the newspaper, okay, that, that was being held. And it was this. Embryo fossa reveals baby tyrannosaurs were dog size. And that seems to me to be utterly huge. Well, Because I thought eggs, you see, because I'm, I'm a lady. So anything coming out that's too big, I thought, owie. So I assumed that but like, like the eggs were kind of small. And how are you going to get a, 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 you know... That, that a dog in that i mean how crumpled is this thing in its egg that's anyway that's what i worried about yes. well the, the the first problem is that they've picked a dog which of course is so ludicrously different in proportion to a tyrannosaur <laughs> it could be a chihuahua you're right a chihuahua would do ridiculously unhelpful <laughs> you know it's just it's just not built the same way at all. um so that that really doesn't help um the first thing to there we go. See that that's they get that's a long tail lizard. Yeah, and <laughs> you will see them with tails considerably longer than that one. Um, so yeah, absolutely absurd. Um, but anyway, so, yeah. enough of that. Enough of that. Yeah, there we yeah. go. Off, off the lizard, back to Tyrannosaur. So the first thing to say is, well, I think we advertise this as being T Rex, and now I've actually checked and read the paper. It's not T Rex. Um, Yes, that's the other problem, is that dog size is extraordinary. Very, you know, Great Dane versus Chihuahua. I did see somewhere that they said Collie, but again, Collies are quite varied in size, and I really don't think it would be the size of a Collie. So I think that's, even when they're specific, they're, they're not very helpful. So it's all a bit rubbish. Um, it's not T-Rex, they're, they're other Tyrannosaurs. Um, they don't know exactly which, probably okay. not because of the age, they're a little bit older. Um, they're from North America. There's several different, there's one paper published um, by a Canadian paleontologist called Greg Funston and colleagues. And they've got several different bits, including a claw and a bit of dentary, so lower jaw, from different sites and different times and different places. So this is a, several different streams of data all coming together. And some of it they think is embryonic. Some of it they think is what we call perinatal. So about the time that it hatched and maybe a bit older um but obviously even then a bit older could be a couple of months and if these things grow fast you could be quite a lot bigger in a couple of months out of the egg um and of course we don't exactly know what species as well so of course if it's a really big species then animal of size x is a bit smaller than in terms of proportions so but because I remember you saying, because I mean, T-Rex was later, wasn't it? And at the time, there are very few other carnivores in it's, North America other than T-Rex. But there's before then, there was... There's nothing else big. Mm, okay. So, we, I mean, do we know... So we don't know what species... They could have stayed the size of dogs. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> uh, no, they're, they're quite little. So the, the, the paper estimate for the for their specimens was between about 75 centimeters and a meter. But remember that tip of the nose to the end of the tail. And in an animal that big, that's going to be about half tail. Um, it's going to be standing maybe kind of knee high 
All right, knee high to you and me, maybe a bit higher on some some quite Thigh high to somebody, somebody right. with. Um, um, so, yeah. I, Collie is not a million miles out, but equally, again, the proportions just make that really ungay, an inelegant comparison. Um, and then, in terms of fitting it in an egg, I mean, a big theropod egg could easily be this big, you know, thirty-five <laughs> centimeters across, thirty-five centimeters long, maybe ten, twelve in so, diameter which then adds to you know quite a bit of volume and if you remember you know, sausage dog that's well, what i'm thinking if you, if, you, if you took this as like just pick the phone up if you took this as the body of the animal and then mm. of course it tucks its legs up and folds its tail around and takes its head and tucks it under the body you can compress even a meter long tyrannosaur into a fairly small package um okay. and again maybe that you know meter is the upper estimate if it's more like 75 and that's an animal which has been hatching and running around for a few weeks and so shrink it down a bit and maybe more like 55 suddenly a 55 centimeter long animal in a 30 centimeter egg when a fair chunk of that is tail is really quite reasonable yeah uh, wallaby. yeah wallabies that's a much better analogy because They've got at least some vague proportions, and people know what a wallaby looks like. They do, uh, unless you see the trouble is, like kangaroos, wallabies, they start off as babies this big. Well, and they crawl, yeah. don't they? They're like okay, but a, a, a small adult wallaby would be a decent um, analogy Comparison. for a yeah. hatchling tyrannosaur, and, and, and so, it's true. Did did tyrannosaurs jump around going, I wanna be a wallaby, I wanna be a wallaby, I wanna be a wallaby, but not a kangaroo? That that is a, a poem by um AF Harold who is watching, which is why I did it. You said that you it's something that I should know and respond to. Like, you should, oh, you should, you fun. should definitely know if T Rexes wanted to be a wallaby. Um, but uh there we go. So this is this is the thing though. I mean, the press do sort of you know come up with the most silly titles, which don't really. I mean, what is the science here? I mean, is there anything that we're learning that's new and interesting from this paper, other than we just have the evidence for it? So there's there's a couple of things. So first of all, it's nice to see those sizes represented because we mm. don't have anything like that. Um, there's been some very very small teeth for tyrannosaurs found, which have been presumed to be hatchling or even embryo but you can't really prove it when it's an isolated tooth um so it's it, it actually and just might... to say that um teeth get preserved more because they're covered in enamel yeah. so you might lose the entire creature but keep a tooth just for that reason yeah. and also they go through their teeth don't they they? they're them. like crocodiles yeah. i mean even 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 as an embryo which has never been born it's still going to have 50 teeth in its mouth and you know only going to have so many skull bones and only got two humeri and to tibia and tibiae, I should say. You and could so, understand why they don't like give them milk, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's it's really cool that they have actually been found. It's really cool that they're fairly diagnostic as tyrannosaurs because we do know that they change quite a lot as they grow. And there was always at least a risk that as embryos or very young hatchlings, they look really weird. So mm. you can imagine if these things have been totally novel. We could easily have named them and said, well, they're, they're a totally new species. They don't match anything else we know of. And it would be a long time before we worked out they're actually tyrannosaurs. But in fact, they've got a bunch of tyrannosaur features in them, even at the embryo stage. So that's quite informative. It's like they have these kind of things, including their teeth shape, even at hatching. So that's kind of new um, uh, or at least very useful. And then the one bit that they also have in the discussion of their paper is about the possible nesting habits. Now, you might immediately think, well, you can't say anything about the nest from a bunch of bits of teeth um, or, or, or jaw or whatever. But actually, what's really quite useful is that a couple of these specimens come from sites where the a lot of the normal fauna that you would so that, that we have what are called, dial back a bit, we have what are called micro sites, which is places where you tend to find very small bones. And you can imagine most stuff, remember, is buried in rivers and lakes and streams and things like that. And small things will be carried very effectively because they're small, particularly if they come off a body and they're just washing around. But when you get a, you know, the right bank or the right slow bit, they will tend to drop. And so these accumulate and you will find patches and places periodically, which is just heaving with small fossils 
because it was clearly just a dead bit of water and everything just got dumped there. These are from one of these micro sites. But what's interesting is that it's a micro site that has very few fish teeth and crocodile teeth and things like this that, and turtles and stuff we would normally associate with water. And that means that it's probably an unusual site. It's probably the result of a flood. And that's why it's picked up a lot of terrestrial animals and relatively not many uh, aquatic animals. Um, now that suggests therefore that these animals are hanging around in relatively dry bits of the environment. Now, on the one hand, that's really obvious. Few, aside from kind of like water birds or crocodiles, which are themselves semi-aquatic, very few egg laying animals lay their eggs next to water because obviously, particularly in a floodplain, because obviously you just need one bit of extra rainfall and all your eggs are drowned. They're probably laying the more inland and more upland areas. But the fact is, we are at least finding evidence for that. Okay. And that's quite handy. And so that suggests that they're not doing anything particularly weird or unusual. They are probably hanging around in the same places that other dinosaurs are laying their eggs. We just really haven't found very much yet. Um, and at some level, that's probably not a big surprise um, because, you know, if you're a dirty, great 10, 12 meter long tyrannosaur, you can probably lay your eggs wherever the hell you want and everyone <laughs> often gets stuck. Um, oh. Probably they have got the very best, driest, most isolated sites available. Okay, okay. Well, I was thinking, you know, you're prime for scavenging because especially if you're little, if you're a little mammal and you see a tyrannosaur, mm. I mean, would it even notice you? That was what I was thinking. So what we've, what we've come across today is basically what I want um, uh, Tom Avery's put in a better question than I can, right. which is scientifically accurate headlines might not always keep the public engaged in paleontology. Where would you draw the line between entertaining and realistic? Because T-Rexes and other Tyrannus possibly laid a net, laid their eggs in places we would have expected is them. not as good as, oh, baby T-Rex was dog size. Yeah, I know. Um... Oof, I mean, I could answer this all day with with various examples, and it's worth saying that it's a, it's a two way street, or or at least there's it's not just the media. A large part, of, you know, as someone who who has written for the mainstream media on multiple different platforms and been engaged in projects as well, um, I know full well a large part of it is the media. But sometimes the scientists themselves write very misleading headlines to get attention, or put out very misleading press releases. I've you wouldn't involved. do that, would you, Dave? No, I don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> the opposite is true. I've had rows with not my current, but uh, pr previous employers about press releases they put out, which were wildly inaccurate, and I complained about them, and they went, oh, no, 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 or care. And it's like, no, they will, and I do. <laughs> and <laughs> if you're trying this to educate and inform the public about your science, maybe not getting it wrong in the headline <laughs> and the title might be a... But William Donahue says, inaccurate info, once it goes viral, can easily be replaced by accurate info. People hold on to the first thing they heard, not the corrections. So actually, yeah, this is this is the thing. There's a game, there's a, a podcast which I used to do the voice. You know my you know my you're listening to Terrible Lizards voice, the, the good one, right? I did that initially for the Skeptics Guide to the Universe. I'm not sure if they're still using me. But at the beginning it goes, You're listening to the Skeptics Guide to the Universe, your escape to reality. Not that I'm plugging other podcasts. And on that, they do a game called Science or Fiction where they give, you know, three news stories out and you have to yeah. guess which one. And everybody always remembers the fiction as the real science. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what. It's, it's just the human brain just goes, that's a really good story. I'm going to remember that. Uh, and, yeah, yeah it, is, so, it is the tragedy of being a paleontologist, as Ross points out yeah so, so. I, you know, so I i try and make things as accurate as possible but i'm also aware that you need to try and make it interesting um and it's true it's not just in headlines it's you know i've edited scripts for documentaries and stuff and they always want everything to be a hundred percent solid what they, they don't like um uncertainty so I'm mm. always going into scripts and going, this probably meant this, and they likely did this, and we understand they did this, or the evidence currently supports. And 
all of that just gets taken straight back out again for the boy <laughs> um, yeah. they, they will not have it because they want people to have confidence in what they're saying. And of course, I don't for that exact reason because we're You're often scientists. not at all. Um, in some of these, you know, if, if you're making a documentary and you just want to show something, which we think is possible at least, I don't have a problem with that. But if that's accompanied with scientists know that they did and you're like, no, we don't. We really <laughs> don't. Then why um, do you tell them things, Dave? It's unfair. Um, yeah. One last thing, which I think we should mention, because we've been mentioning um, small little T-Rexes. And it's a thing which, and one of our listeners, who's Harry, who's age seven, so don't say rude words because Harry knows them all, and you'll be rubbish anyway. So Harry, age seven, <laughs> wants to know, generally, <laughs> wants to know what are your thoughts about whether Nanotyrannus is a separate species, and does this new discovery add any evidence for or against the existence of Nanotyrannus? So he, I mean, we covered Nanotyrannus yeah, in the first, in first episode, ever episode. I mean, I mean we should probably do a whole episode on it at some point. Um, I know. I think, I think we've even brought it back up in one of the others from a question from a guest. Um, short version is no, I don't think Nanogetranus is its own genus or species. I mean, it, I think we've covered this before. At one level, Nanotyrannus pretty much definitively isn't because the original, the holotypes of the original skull that was used to define Nanotyrannus I think everyone, including the people who favour this idea, agree is a T-Rex. So at that, at, at that degree, at least, the name Nanotyrannus is just a synonym of T-Rex. Whether or not there is a dwarf Tyrannosaur out there, which shouldn't then fall be called Nanotyrannus, is another matter. But again, I don't know anyone who, well, I, uh, let me rephrase. I do know people who, who think that it's real, including paleontologists. But if you look at the Tyrannosaur experts, which I'm questionably one, they <laughs> don't. In fact, there, there, was a, there was a paper I contributed to three or four years ago by half a dozen of the leading Tyrannosaur researchers called basically Nano Tyrannus is just T-Rex. Um, so if all the people who really work on T-Rex growth and taxonomy all say it isn't, that should be a fairly good reason to think that it isn't. Um, and then does this study tell us anything more about it? Not really, because we don't even know exactly which species these bits belong to. And there's not enough of them to say anything meaningful about their growth or shape change or anything beyond that, other than the fact that we can tell they're tyrannosaurs because they've got these unique teeth shapes. Uh, which we'd have guessed, but it's still nice to have confirmed. And we already see in fairly small young tyrannosaurs that we do have. Um, so this really doesn't shed any light on that. The the only way that the nanotyrannus thing is going to be resolved, or I think the, the, the way which is going to resolve it to most people's satisfaction is this dueling dinosaurs two specimen, which has recently been bought by is it Raleigh in North Carolina, uh, and is being studied. So it's at a proper research institute with a museum and a university and dinosaur paleontologists looking at it. And that is a specimen which a lot of people online have championed as, well, this is the one which will show all those researchers that we were right to be skeptical all along and that nano tyrannus or something like it really, really, really is real. Well, now we've got one of those specimens in a lab being worked on by the kind of people who said we're not convinced with the available data. And indeed, that is the phrase we've always used. It's like, we're perfectly prepared to accept that it is, but no one's ever given us any convincing reason to think so. Um, so we, this specimen will be studied. Wait for that one to come out. And everything else until that study is done is hot air. And I wish everyone would leave it the hell alone. <laughs> OK, well, we'll wait for that study to come out. I think Joshua has said something similar. Um, so uh, very, very quickly. It usually happen. Harry will probably be at university. but That's fine. Harry can wait. We'll, we'll be sort of ancient and dead by then. But um, so uh, one because we, we've gone a bit over what we said we would, but we're going to do this anyway because we started we fiddled around with looking at, you know, there's a lizard tails. So uh, final question comes from uh, Marcus. And he says, is it possible to find fossil evidence of parent or both parents tyrant dinos taking care of the hatchings like the Oviraptorosaurus or fossils from Mongolia? 
Well, maybe. I mean, there's no reason to think that with a sufficiently giant tidal wave flood or unexpected sandstorm or giant carbon monoxide release, which would kill everything dead without even knowing it. But we couldn't get one or even a pair of tyrannosaurs preserved next to a nest. Um, but even then, you're always going to have uncertainty because you don't know that those are true parents. I mean, even, even if you... They could have just been visiting. Well, but even if there's embryos in the same thing, you know, mm. if, you were a, if you were a T. rex wandering around and you came across the nest of someone who's not you, yeah, it's, a, well, A, free food, and B, destroy the competition for your babies. Um, so, you know, yeah. lion kill lion cubs all the time. Um, and that's true of lots of species. So you, you're just left with this constant uncertainty. I think you'd need basically a T-Rex on a nest. Which they're just so big and not that feathery. I doubt one would sit on a nest. Janet's um, being silly, just to say. That's... <laughs> <laughs> There's a there's a big were T Rex scavengers or uh, predators. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well done, Janet. You made me giggle. Right, come on. We we've 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 gone way over our our, our, our limit of things. Thank you so much um, for watching us live, and um, thank you for all saying hello. You were marvelous. We love you dearly. Um, do um, catch up. We we have. Um, Dave's massive, amazing Spinosaurus paper, which came out last week. If you want to find out more about how Spinosaurus was not a pursuit predator, but was a sort of like, you know, ambusher, wader, heron type thing, but with a sail and pretty tail, um, then um, do um, listen to Terrible Lizards. Um, on Wednesday, we have a brand new episode with the lovely Dr. Adam Rutherford, who is far too beautiful to be into science. And uh, yeah, and we got a whole series of brilliant guests coming up. So um, please do um, say, um, you know, everything just say just say hello and everything tell your friends about us and thank you so much for joining us here today i have been izzy lawrence this has been uh dr dave hone and uh we will see you next time so bye bye